Welcome or welcome back to the company of the cat. Hi, how are you? Today's video is about Valyrian steel and I would also like to have your opinions in the comment section. I will talk about individual blades, but I'm also going to throw in a theory about the forging of Valyrian steel, even though I'm not 100% sure we will find out the truth about it. And I will also talk about Lightbringer and Dawn. We only know a few things about Valyrian steel, apart from the fact that magic and spells play a role in the forging, which makes the steel special and magical. We have instances where people believe Dragonflame is involved, but we cannot be sure that this is the case considering that Danny and John have just heard stories from other people that they themselves heard from others. It could just be that people associate Valyria to dragons and thus believe that they use dragons for everything. Maybe that is the case and Dragonflame was used, but I'm not completely sure and the reason is what we know about Kohor. The free city of Kohor is the only place where the art of reworking Valyrian steel is preserved and they guard the spells needed to reforge Valyrian steel without it losing its abilities. In the world book, we are told about Maester Paul. He spent many years in Kohor investigating the secrets of the blacksmiths there. He was thrice publicly whipped and cast out for making too many inquiries. The final time, his hand was also cut off because he allegedly stole a Valyrian steel blade, but according to him, the true reason for his final exile was the discovery of blood sacrifices, including that of infants, which the Kohoric smiths used in their efforts to produce steel equal to the original Valyrian steel. Kohor was founded by people from Valyria, and they were not shy about magic, they still use blood magic publicly to this day. And they definitely know more stuff than the average Westerosi who believes it was just about dragons. If these people try to recreate it without dragons, maybe dragons were not necessary. Another reason is the weapons the Ironborn of all had, these things sound like Valyrian steel. In the video about the volcanic iron islands, I said that I don't think it was, but I'm taking it back. If dragons were not involved, then it easily could be similar steel to the Valyrian one. Since from the stories we get, the Ironborn of old were meddling with both fire and blood magic. Maybe dragon fire was used in Valyria, since it seems like dragon flame itself has magical abilities, but I don't believe it is the key or even necessary. Now, with all this info, I'm gonna make a recipe for Valyrian steel myself. Valyrian steel is obviously steel, so we need iron and carbon, along with sacrifices and the spells we know they sing while forging and reforging. Blood magic and sacrifices don't necessarily mean they use the blood, per se. Mel, by burning Alistair alive, practiced blood magic, and from any quotes, we get that the magic the Valyrians used was rooted in blood and fire. Even the Dragonflame's magic is rooted to blood, according to Marwyn. So I would say you don't need a dragon. I tried to think of a way to use blood in the forging process, but I really don't think it is possible. Maybe it is the material engineer in me talking here, but using blood either as a flux or for quenching is not going to work even in a magical setting. And since George is following some basic rules in the universe, even with magic, I really don't think this is the case. Blood as a flux is going to be quite dangerous since there is a lot of water in it, which can cause steam explosions. Plus, I'm not 100% sure what is going to happen with the organic matter in the blood, because I think it's gonna just lead to unwanted byproducts and impurities. Now, blood is also not very good for quenching. It has a very slow cooling curve, and it's not capable of hardening steel. At the time, the best thing for quenching would be water or piss. And I'm not even gonna comment on tempering a blade by thrusting it into a person. It's gonna be a mess. It will lose its shape, and you need a crazy amount of power to put a non-tempered sword through a person. Like, there is no way. That being said, using the ashes of a person in the forging could work. Blacksmiths used ashes as a component in the forging process of steel. Ashes were used as an insulating material to protect the steel from overheating and to help control the temperature during the forging process. They were used in par carburizing to improve the hardness and wear resistance of the steel and were also used as a flux to remove impurities and such. Nowadays, obviously, more specialized materials are used for carburizing and flaxing, but ashes have been historically used in the forging process of steel. So during the forging, I think they needed the spells, maybe ashes from a human, possibly burned in a ritual, not blood, if a sacrifice is needed during the forging and not just after. But the most important thing you need, I believe, is the right iron. The iron the Valyrians were using came from the deposits in the Fortin Flames. The burning mountains of the Fortin Flames were reached with ore, and the Valyrians hungered for it. Copper and tin for the bronze of their weapons and monuments, later iron for the steel of the legendary blades. Dragon glass is a glass formed by immense heat and pressure, and can only be found in volcanic areas. 
Obsidian in the books is the same as the one in real life, but with additional magical properties that are there by nature. As I said in my video about the wells, I believe the volcanoes, like the trees, conduct power from a source very deep into planet Earth. From the way people talk about the 14 flames, it seems that they were an immense source of magic, due to their sheer size and number. 14 or 14,000. What man dares count them? It is not wise for mortals to look too deep at those fires, my friend. Those are the fires of God's own wrath, and no human flame can match them. We are small creatures. Men. If the volcanoes produce magical obsidian, why not magical iron too? All obsidian is volcanic in origin, so dragon glass has magical properties. But the amount of iron that is directly formed from volcanic activity is very small compared to the total amount of iron. So not all iron is volcanic and therefore magical. But if it comes from a volcanic source, then like obsidian, it can be, I think. Add blood magic and you can make a bombas alloy. They use the magical obsidian for glass candles. Why not use the magical iron for magical steel? That would explain why people cannot make it anymore and they can only reforge it. If the iron used isn't volcanic in origin, and on top of that they don't have the exact spells and the way the sacrifices were made, it's not as easy. As for dragon flame, yes, it could give some properties to the steel, I believe, but I really don't think it was a necessary step for the forging of Valyrian steel, since the reason dragon flame is magical is blood and fire. What fits a dragon fire? All Valyrian sorcery was rooted in blood or fire. I think the iron itself plays the biggest role, and we can see this with the Iron Throne too. Some of the blades are still sharp, but not all of them. Between its finger was a blade, the points of a twisted sword, fanning out like talons from arms on the throne. Even after three centuries, some were still sharp enough to cut. Dragonflame was involved, but not all the blades were affected, so the material itself plays a bigger role than the flame. Even with Damascus steel, the alloy Valyrian steel was inspired from, it is believed that one of the reasons it's so hard to recreate it is the difference in raw materials and loss of knowledge of key ore sources, and not just the loss of manufacturing techniques. As for the use of blood, it makes sense to be used after. After the forging is done and the blade is ready, it could need more sacrifices and spells to make it better. Kinda like Beric who used his blood to set the blade aflame. Maybe they magically infused the steel with blood from sacrifices to make it even stronger. It is said that her cry of anguish and ecstasy left a crack across the face of the moon, but her blood and her soul and her strength and her courage all went into the steel. This cannot be done with an untempered sword, but it could be done with a tempered one and this could be an extra magical step to make the blade even better. Or after the forging they could be weaving more blood sacrifice spells so that the blade would get stronger by absorbing the blood and or soul of everyone slain by it, and that would explain why they don't need maintenance, since they would feed from their kills. A very common trope in fantasy, by the way, swords that feed off the souls and blood of their victims. Another clue that hints at the iron itself being magical is all the stories the first men have. According to Old Nan, the others hated iron. To be honest, at first I thought they were just legends similar to the real life ones, where iron, most specifically called iron, was used against supernatural beings. But Jojen and Mira swore by bronze and iron, and the Starks traditionally placed an iron longsword on the lap of each statue of the Lords of Winterfell within the crypt, to keep vengeful spirits trapped. This is kinda weird because it is so easy. Just called iron? I don't think so. The only thing I can think of is that they used a spell on the iron like we know they did with bronze and the runes. But if it was just that, then why did it work only with iron and not with bronze too? Additionally, why did they stick with Dragonglass? We know that after the Long Night, the Children of the Forest and the Night's Watch had an arrangement where the children would give them Dragonglass weapons yearly. Why not have Iron too, just to be sure? I think that both Bronze and Non-Volcanic Iron, which means most iron, were mostly used for protection and couldn't kill. We know the runes on the Royce's armor are for protection, and that the iron swords are there just to keep the spirits in the crypts, not kill something. We also have Dunk's Prayer, Oak and Iron guard me, well. And all in all, I think that they could infuse the metals with green magic, earth magic, to give them extra properties, but it was not enough to kill the others. That, I think, is only possible if the material came from the fires deep beneath the earth, like dragon glass and the limited amount of volcanic iron ore. And the other type of iron that most likely works is meteoric iron. Before the advent of iron smelting, 
Meteoric iron was the only source of iron metal apart from minor amounts of telluric iron. Meteoric iron was already used before the beginning of the Iron Age to make cultural objects, tools, and weapons. We have one sword for sure, Dawn, but I think Lightbringer was also made from the Blackstone that Bloodstone worshipped and was some sort of sister sword to Dawn. Not only does it fit thematically, but it is supported by all the parallels between Bloodstone and Ezra Hai in the novels, which is the other person with a magical sword. Unlike run-of-the-mill Valyrian blades, Lightbringer and Dawn are different. They are the swords. I think the Valyrians didn't make the steel to use against the others. Yes, it might work, but I think they just wanted magical blades with extremely good mechanical properties. Because if they were only made to fight the others, or demons, or whatever, Obsidian is right there and it doesn't need that much processing. Plus, they started making Valyrian steel after the Long Night. I think the dragon steel blades they were talking about were not about Valyrian steel, but about blades made of fallen stars. Meteors and comets are associated to dragons in real life, and in the novels, as we have seen, Dawn and most likely Lightbringer were made from fallen celestial bodies. They literally have out of this world power, and neither of them can be wielded by a random person. The Danes pass the sword only to worthy people. The Asai prophecy says that Azrahai is to be reborn and will glide bring her once again. We are waiting for someone worthy, and not just anyone. Renowned swords appear in the folklore of every sword-using nation. The thing is that many of these swords were cursed. The theme of a cursed sword that causes evil deeds to be committed wherever drawn was taken up by several modern fantasy writers, and it's inspired by folklore and mythology. Since we are reading Martin, though, I don't think the sword itself pushes the wielder to become evil. These are decisions the wielder makes. If the person is unworthy and magic is involved, then bad stuff may happen. We have seen over and over again in the novels that magic has a price. These two swords specifically are heavily inspired by both the Ebony Blade, as I said in my video about the coastal donate houses, and by Stormbringer and Mornblade from Moorcock's fantasy novels. I would also add the sword in Tolkien's work and Kalandor of Wheel of Time, but the first two are the most prominent references in my opinion. The Ebony Blade had two forms, a purified one and the one with a curse, a curse that returned when Namor killed his wife with it. The purified form of the Ebony Blade is very similar to Dawn, and the one with the curse sounds dangerously close to what we know about Lightbringer. The story of Stormbringer and Mornblade is also very interesting. Stormbringer is an enchanted black blade and an agent of chaos. Stormbringer can cut through any material not protected by sorcery, and it drinks the soul from any living creature upon delivering any wound. The person wielding the sword is an emperor named Elric that has albinism. Elric hates the sword, but he also needs it. Because of the curse, he has killed friends, family, and lovers with it. Stormbringer has a brother sword named Mornblade, which was at one time wielded by Elric's cousin and enemy, Yerkun. And this is the thing, these names are similar to the names we have for Azor Ahai, one person embodying the hero and the enemy. No one is purely bad or totally good. People did messed up things and tried to fix them. The fight is within one thing, not between two. All these conflicts we see are the different sides of the same coin. The swords like in Morcock's works, Symbolize addiction, addiction to power, to violence, is more of an internal fight, because if you get past all the harmful tendencies, harmful to yourself and by extension to others, things would be better. Yes, no one can be the best person ever and everyone makes mistakes, but the least we can do is try our best. And if we do make mistakes, we must then to try to correct them. This is why I believe the swords themselves are not evil. The wielder is evil if they decide to be an asshole. Therein lies the difference between Valyrian steel and the swords. These two swords were necessary. The sad truth is that in some instances, cruel things will and must happen. And this is why they are used in the Great War and not all the time. Extreme times require extreme measures. But Valyrian steel didn't have a reason to exist. Killing slaves just to make the best and most unique metal so you can win a manufactured piecing contest is not the same, it's just you being a terrible person. And because of all of this, I really think that Darkstar will take Dawn in Winds. He is the Dane that looks pretty on the outside, but he is an asshole and cringy. Buddy, pick a struggle, don't do both. <laughs> Plus, he has one black strand in his silver hair, which could be symbolic of how the pretty white and alive with light Dawn has a curse on its core. And it would make sense, to be honest. There must be a reason why they only let worthy people wield it. 
because if it is used when not necessary, there could be consequences. Magic has a price, and using a magical sword for petty reasons is not very noble. We saw it in the story of Galadon too. He had the sword, but he only used it three times, when he truly needed to. I have one last thing to say, and I'll move on to the rest of the blades. If Don turns black because someone used it unethically, you will hear my screams, no matter how far you will be. I now want to make some predictions, or at least try to, about some Valyrian steel blades. John will stick with Longclaw, I believe. It even has the white wolf on the pommel. Some will take Heartbane, but I'm not gonna lie, I don't know if he will keep it. Yes, he has improved and he has done 100% of the damage to the others so far, and I would love for him to have it, but not for a battle. Maybe he could keep it for research purposes or something, that would be great. I doubt we will see Bright Roar. The blade was lost and Victarion fishing out Geryon with Bright Roar, I don't know, seems quite improbable. And I don't think there are many ways, at least at this point in the story, to see them again. I do think we will see Dark Sister though. The last known wielder was Bloodraven and it most likely was still with him when he went to the wall, so I believe it is in the cave and Mira will take it. Mira is better with a spear and a trident, I doubt a sword would be the best weapon for her, so I think the sword will end up with Arya. She is the Dark Sister and she had a fascination with Visenya and warrior women in general since she was very young, so it makes sense for her to have it. Blackfire is most likely with the Golden Company, but I think Young Griff won't survive for long, so even if he wills it for some time, someone else will eventually take it. If Baristan returns to Westeros, I would love for him to have a badass blade, and since we have very few of them, it would be great if good fighters got to use them. Even if he isn't a Targ, I don't care. After all, he's the most loyal of the Kingsguard and a great and noble knight overall, like Aemon the Dragon Knight was. I think it would be fitting if he got to wield the Conqueror's own sword to protect his queen, since Dany can't really use it herself. Oathkeeper will stay with my girl Brienne, obviously, and Widow's Whale I think will pass to Jaime. Let's hope he gets better at fighting with his left hand. And it would be great for him to have the sister sword to the one he gave Brienne. The Ironborn already have Red Rain and Nightfall, and they are at the reach now. I'm not sure about Red Rain, but I think Euron will take Nightfall from Haras to complete the Valyrian set. We also have Orphan Maker at the Ritz. The sword used to belong to House Roxton, but after the dance Unwin Pick took it, so I'm guessing it's still at Starpike if they didn't lose it during the Blackfire Rebellions. I think it would be great if we saw it again. Same goes for Vigilance, I would love to see Vigilance again. The Valyrian sword of House Hightower? If we do, it's gonna be in the north most likely. During the dance, Roderick Dustin killed Ormond Hightower, and I really don't think he would just leave a Valyrian steel sword behind. Plus, we know Ormund had it during the Civil War. Ned did return the body of Willem Dustin for whatever reason, but if the sword was with him at the Tower of Joy, I believe he would return it with the horse. Either way, it is very possible that the sword is at Baraton now if it wasn't returned to the Hightowers, or otherwise lost. This is it for this video, I hope you had fun watching this, if you did press a like, comment whatever you want about swords, and tune in for the next one. Until then, bye!